It's May the 24th and you're watching Curiously Polar. Welcome back to our show about all things very north and very south. I'm Chris Marquardt. This is Henry Paul. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm great. How about you? Uh, good. After we <laughs> fixed all the technical issues and everything, everything is fine. Ah, so, yeah, we are back with a whole bunch of stuff. And, of course, as usual, we start with our Polar News Reel. Um, and the first... The first uh, Thing that I saw was that I came across this, of course, on Twitter because that's where I am, and lots of people <laughs> shared this thing. So I think I've seen this at least ten times from different sources, um, and it is the temperature development in the Arctic. We have a report from a part in uh, in the Russian Arctic that went over thirty degrees in. May, and uh, Scott Duncan reports this, so 30 degrees, 86.5 Fahrenheit in the Arctic, hotter than pretty much all of Europe at that point. Um, yeah. Is it exceptional? Yes and no. So we do have um, like a pattern of um, yeah, changing temperatures in the Arctic, but at the same time, uh, we haven't reached those uh, high temperatures yet so we have um here certainly uh, an exception but if you remember uh, the episode about the uh, amok about the uh, gold stream current then we see that there is a, a pattern in the polar vortex um where we have low and high pressures and low and high temperature areas and that certainly here is a high temperature area um but 30 plus degrees within the arctic is everything but normal Okay, so um, it's something that, I don't know, that we should be concerned about, but um, I'm, yeah, I, I can't really, I, how often does this happen? Has it happened before 30 degrees in the Arctic? I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure. Okay. I can't answer that. Okay. Anyway, um, let's put this on the newsreel. And well, the, the, the important thing here is, um, if you look at this picture when you watch the video, um, you can see the Arctic Circle is highlighted there with this uh, strap line. And the area in, in Russia, in Siberia, is one of the, if not the largest permafrost area uh, on shore. Right. So when we have 30 plus degrees uh, on temperatures and possibly more than just one day, then we have a big threat here of losing the permafrost, which is um, on one side, of course, a thawing ground. At the same time, it's releasing methane, which accelerates the um, yeah, greenhouse gas uh, emissions tremendously. So we have here kind of a big issue um, happening with those temperatures. And methane is like many, many times more uh, active in terms of CO, uh, in terms of warming potential than CO two, for example. So, but luckily, it stays not as long in, in the atmosphere. So right. there's a, a pro and a con. But certainly, the effect, the short term effect, is um, many times larger, larger than uh, carbon dioxide. All right. Uh, the second piece on the newsreel is uh, a report that I came across by the. Antarctic report in on Twitter, of course, again. Um, and that is a happy birthday to the Twin Otter DHC-6, um, which has taken its first flight 56 years ago in 1965. And uh, the Twin Otter is, a, is, a, is an airplane. And uh, one of the things that makes it special is that it is capable of taking, taking off and landing on very short strips so it, it's in the air very fast it stops very fast when it comes down and um the, i i didn't even see the text i first saw the pic picture that is shared here i think it looks like it's a picture of a viking air um which is uh, the twin otter flying over yeah what are these things that we see here <laughs> on the video these they, they look like ice cubes but they are yeah, they are big. Ice I mean, cubes, big, but big just cubes. <laughs> exactly, exceptionally big ice cubes um, called Sarax, which is uh, usually found at the yeah, end of a glacier somewhere where it's just mm. breaking off uh, tremendously. Um, 
it's mixed with crevasses, but basically what we have here is ice towers called uh, Sarax. Really, really beautiful. Um, something we can see in many glaciers in Antarctica. It's really uh, interesting, but it unfolds, obviously, from an aerial perspective, much, much better than from the Zodiac uh, on the waterline. And um, yeah, Twin Otter, very, very a versatile airplane also can cope um, much, much better than many other planes with those extreme environments in mm. Antarctica, but also in the Arctic. And as you uh, just told me, the Himalaya. I've actually spent, uh, I've, I've, flown, I've flown in Twin Otters numerous times in uh, Nepal, in the on the south side of Mount Everest, because uh, I've been doing photography there and hiking there. And one of the ways to get to the mountains, the easiest way to get to the mountains is to take a twin otter from Kathmandu <laughs> Airport up to Lukla Airport, which is this tiny mountain airport which has a which has an, an um, uh, the the strip is on an incline, so you land onto that incline, and at the top there's a big wall, so it just ends. You can't if 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 you're committed to land there, you have to land there. And, but it's also, uh, I think, at the at the bottom, it's a sharp edge. Pretty much. So what they do is um, they <laughs> land there, and, and as it's on an incline, they get to a stop uh, early enough. And when they start, they turn. They have, a, they have a turnaround time of like five minutes because you have to be quick because it's the mountains and the weather can change quickly. So uh, hikers, climbers uh, get on board and off board. And then at the top, they turn it around. They, uh, they wrap up the big... Uh, props as a turbo prop machine pretty much and uh with the with the brakes fastened and then when the thing is at maximum output they loosen the brakes and this thing goes off and then like probably 10 or 20 meters before the drop um the plane takes off with 16 people on board so it, it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's exciting so twin otter is dear and near to my heart nicely put <laughs> um we have one oh, no, we, have, we have a couple more uh, things on the newsreel. Uh, the next one is uh, connected with uh, the melting of uh, frost in, I think it's in Norway. And uh, yes. it is uh, about archaeology because archaeology uh, isn't just in the ground. Archaeology is also in glaciers because people cross the glaciers and uh, stuff, they lost stuff or they left stuff and that gets... Um, well, lost in the glacier, and then at one point it might come out again, or in case of the ice melting, uh, it comes out quicker. And this is what's happening in uh, Norway. And there are like, uh, it says, global warming has unlocked hundreds of Viking artifacts from the ice of the Norwegian mountains in recent years. Uh, and there are a few here that are mentioned, like 1,300-year-old uh, arrows um, from the peak period of hunting. Then there's uh, like a complete tinderbox, which again, they needed to make fire. And uh, because it's complete, they assume it has been lost. Someone just lost it. It wasn't discarded as broken. Um, a horseshoe, which interestingly enough, um, in, in, in ground archaeology, fabrics are often hard to find because uh, they will not survive deteriorate. being in the ground yeah. it deteriorate much faster in the ice there is for example the landbrain tunic which again is made from cloth and um, in glaciers that stuff just survives better so that's a different kind of archaeology that they can do there here's a here's a funny one uh, this is a kitchen whisk to make dough but it has a pointy end which is unusual and they assume that it was had a double use maybe as a peg for a tent or something so <laughs> next time and a goat bit i think that's what you put in a goat's mouth um a birch distaff like it's an interesting article um so again global warming and uh the glaciers are melting faster these artifacts are coming out of the glaciers faster right the, the good outcome here is that it provides a much better insight, um, understanding the culture, for example, of the Vikings or the people in general who lived uh, near or at glaciers. Um, we have similar situations in Greenland where we learn or uh, have the chance to learn more about uh, Inuit, about the different Inuit um, uh, cultures settling in different times. And um, as you said, glaciers preserve much, much better 
Um, if you lose it on a glacier, if you lose it in front of it and the glacier just goes over it, then um, it's less likely to survive. But yeah, it's pretty much the artsy effect um, we know from the from the Alps where um, the mummy has been preserved quite uh, quite good. And similar, we do have here now some um, textiles um, as right. remains, which can give you much better insight of how uh, things have been used in uh, yeah, ordinary daily life. All right, and then um, one more item is uh, iceberg. Well, actually, we have two more items. I didn't tell you before, but there's a new big iceberg that we need to talk about. But first, we'll need to talk about uh, carbon storage in icebergs. What's this one about? This one is about, we talked a lot about icebergs in the past, about uh, icebergs breaking off in Antarctica, and we followed um, A68A quite, um, yeah. quite closely. And... Uh, this new study has shown that those icebergs have a huge impact on um, the, uh, the carbon dissolving of the oceans because as the icebergs uh, float um, through the ocean, they just release a lot of minerals and nut uh, nut uh, nutrients into the ocean, um, creating kind of a stream, a spur of phytoplankton following it. And that can actually follow for over a day. So just from from a distance, depending on how much the iceberg is uh, traveling, and that creates uh, a bigger carbon sink than the ocean already has, and that's a very very positive side effect. So a melting iceberg will create a carbon sink. It will in in some. It will enhance the abilities of the carbon sink ocean already. Yeah, that's that's in, indeed very interesting. Is it so is it far, a big effect, or are we just talking something that is barely measurable? It's something that uh, scientists are looking into deeper right now. So okay. th this effect has been uh, just discovered, and what the scientists uh, of that study particularly say is that it needs more research to get a better understanding of how big the the impact actually is. But we're talking about, for example, the Southern Ocean has about ten percent of the entire carbon sink abilities of the world's oceans, and twenty percent of those ten percent are just by icebergs so mm -hmm. it's a fifth of the entire um carbon um carbon sink capabilities of the southern ocean so it's uh, it's not too small i would say as an effect mm -hmm. okay well and then speaking of icebergs um we all fondly remember a68 um, which is not an iceberg anymore it's too small in two small pieces now but um we have a new one and that is uh, happened a couple of weeks ago, and it is A76, so we have to learn a new name here. Um, CNET and others have written about this, and it is a sizable chunk of ice. It is, as far as I know, currently the biggest iceberg on the planet. It is indeed, yes. And it has, it's... Um, yeah, the size of uh, the island of Mallorca. Or Rhode Island, mm. <laughs> so, oh, Rhode Island. <laughs> for the Americans. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. It's long. It's a. It's a long. It's like an ironing board shape, kind of. Yeah, indeed, and it's also um, yeah very similar to I sixty eight A has um, possibly minor effects of uh, climate change of a warming ocean, but in in general we can see on the satellite picture. Um, not very clearly, but we might just uh, have some other pictures in the in the show notes where we can see the structure of the ice shelf much much better, um, where you have your prefabricated uh, breakup lines. So this here was just a question of time. Um, so yeah, we were actually waiting for it. Um, the the big question always is where does the the vertical uh, breakup happen, and that's more or less a surprise here. But uh, the iceberg was expected. Um, it's much, much bigger than the one from the Brunt ice shelf we co uh, covered a few weeks back. Um, so yeah, for, for now, for the time being, this is the largest iceberg uh, currently floating in the oceans. It is 4,320 square kilometers. <laughs> it's amazingly big. Um, and is it is it like A68A that it's it's kind of thin so it's 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 not very deep or it's a, it's slightly different so last night's shelf is um rather thin the run ice shelf has an average thickness of around 600 meters okay and that's more the other was like 200 meters right exactly so yeah. even if you would say it's half um at the glacier's edge then we still talk about 300 meters but uh yeah something like that 
it's uh, yeah it's so, interesting so to see research on i'm it. just i'm just curious if it might be with us longer than a68 or well but we'll we'll watch it we'll watch it it's really interesting to see how uh, how it's picked up because uh, the ron ice shelf is actually uh, kind of a broader neighbor of the Larsen ice shelf so it's in the Weddell Sea yeah. so it can actually get picked up by the Weddell Gyre um, to just circle within the Weddell Sea or just get uh, catapulted into the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and then it would actually follow the um, the history of A68A much faster than A68A which was stuck in uh, yeah, in the area it broke off for quite some time but okay, let's but see. That's going to that's gonna be interesting again. We don't know yet, so we'll figure that one out for sure. Um, okay, that ends our Polar Newsreel for this episode. We have uh, not just a new episode coming up for you right now, but we have an entire series coming up about polar explorers. So Exactly. Super great. Um, yeah, I'm really curious about that uh, episode we had. Um a series of related episodes um, in the past summer, uh, Voices of the North, which came out as kind of a um, mini series. And this year, um, we're going to put the focus on polar exploration. And I'd really like to use that chance to highlight um, a few explorers that are truly important to the history of polar exploration, but possibly have been forgotten or they're not as much recognized these days as some other colleagues. Um so the series, the Polar Explorer series, will try to shed some light on um, not only on the uh, on, on the big, well-known names like Fritjof Nansen, Roald Amundsen, John Franklin, and so on, but largely at lesser-known stories with no less significant achievement. So we have a number of uh, Polar Explorers which possibly are not so much um, in the back of our hats anymore, and that's something we would like to change. And we have some very... Uh, interesting stories lined up for you in the coming weeks so yeah I'm, I'm super excited to kick that off and we kick it off um this week with a woman because somehow we forget the exploration stories of women more quickly <laughs> because there are so much more stories of men um and just in in her time the woman we're talking about today has achieved something truly incredible uh she has earned herself the title as the woman who tamed the arctic and i'm talking about Louise Anna Boyd. And don't worry if her name does not mean much to you yet. Before I haven't I heard got the name before. Me neither. That's exactly where I wanted to go. Um, I haven't heard her name before I got involved with that um, with that uh, polar exploration uh, miniseries. So for me, that's uh, also new. But some really interesting uh, stories are uh, developing around her. And she actually had... Um, a very interesting life. So they're not as uh, numerous as their male counterparts. Women who have taken Arctic expeditions have made um, great contributions to our understanding of the Arctic uh, today and our ability to access uh, pristine regions. And Louise Arna Boyd, uh, she was born on September 16 in 1887, was one of such women. Uh, she was an American. Um in 1955, she became the first woman to fly over the North Pole. She was also the third woman in history ever awarded the Chevalier Cross of the Order of St. Olaf by the Norwegian government. And that's actually a big deal in Norway. And one of the greatest challenges facing any explorer in the 19th and 20th century was obviously securing funds uh, to be able to mount expeditions, right? And here, the young Louis Boyd had quite an edge. She was one of three children uh, born to an investment banker called John Franklin Boyd and his wife, Louise Cook Arner. And Louise enjoyed a very, very privileged upbringing. She was really born into a rich family, had a quality education. Um, but all of that came with a very, sort, uh, very sad development. Um, the turn was that both of her brothers died of a heart disease very close to each other, um, leaving Boyd as the only child of her family and the only heir to the family's fortune at the same time. Boyd's parents then passed away one after the other in 1919 and 1920 and alone in the world and with a substantial amount of wealth at her disposal, Boyd decided to travel and she traveled to Svalbard in 1924 where 
as she Cruz introduced her to the phenomena of uh, polar pack ice for the very first time. And her intense interest in the Arctic grew being in her late 30s. Her first sight of the pack ice drew uh, Louise Boyd in um, with its beauty and the prospect of adventure. The experience she had there proved instrumental in her life and she then began planning her own Arctic adventure. She really wanted to return and, well, she certainly had one big advantage and that was money was not an issue for her. So faced with a gigantic pile of cash and <laughs> no one to share it with, she did the uh, the least logical thing possible for a fancy socialite of that time. She decided to become an explorer. And by 1926, she as, decided as to... As you do. <laughs> Let me become an <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> In uh, 1926, uh, she then uh, chartered a supply ship and pop up to the Arctic as if Ernest Shackleton ending up stranded in the middle of the Antarctic for months wasn't still extremely fresh in everyone's mind, so she really didn't care. Originally, her desire to go to the Arctic was for adventure, for um, more for entertainment, but was thrilled by the icy remoteness, um, but she also killed many polar bears as part of a big game hunting expedition, which was highly respected at the time, we also have to mention. But a dramatic event changed her perspective and that was in 1928 and I'm sure some of our listeners might recall it. After months of meticulous research and planning she was about to embark on a second pleasure trip to the Arctic but when she arrived in Tromsø shortly before the voyage was to begin she actually learned that her childhood hero and a famed Norwegian polar explorer himself Roald Amundsen who had been the first to conquer the South Pole just a few years back in 1911, had gone missing in his own attempt to find and rescue Italian explorer Umberto Nobile, who actually crash-landed his um, Zeppelin in the Arctic. Louise put then her ship at the disposal of the Norwegian government and unexpectedly became one of the leaders of uh, the daring quest of international significance. She participated in the 10-week rescue mission and traveled about 10,000 miles, which is roughly 16,000 uh, kilometers, across the Arctic Ocean. Although she found no trace of Amundsen and his team, Boyd was later then awarded the Chevalier's Cross of the Order of St. Olaf and uh, as well the Chevalier of the French Legion of Honor um, for her efforts. From then on, Boyd was totally committed not just to polar exploration, but to polar science. Not being a scientist herself, that's a big change in her life. So throughout the 1930s, Boyd then partnered up with the American Geographical Society to explore uncharted regions and she led several expeditions. Um, she brought scientists along with her to study and help uh, interpret what she saw. All these expeditions generated new data in the field of geology, oceanography, botany, glaciology, Boyd served on most of her expeditions as the so-called official photographer, uh, documenting ice patterns along the Greenland coast, for example. She also pioneered the use of photogrammetry, the science of taking photographs to create models um, of, uh, models or map in inaccessible places. She mapped previously uncharted regions of uh, Greenland, filmed and uh, photographed topography, sea ice, glacial features, and land formations. And today we can actually go into the uh, US um, uh, Senate library and we can actually just go back to the photographs of her, uh, which she left behind, um, which is giving a pretty good idea of the uh, yeah, fjords of uh, East Greenland. In the summer of 1933 then, the American, uh, the American Geographical Society uh, sponsored her expedition to Yon Mayan Island in the North Atlantic and then also to the Fjord region of the east coast of Greenland. So the east coast of Greenland really grew dear to her heart. She really started to focus on that. And the expedition included several scientists, but the botanists became ill and Boyd then took uh, on the job of collecting plant specimen herself. She undertook several expeditions uh, in the same area in 1937 and 1938. And in recognition of her uh, important work, 
an area in King uh, in East Greenland's King Christian the Tenth land was named Louis Boyd Land, which is actually really at the end of a fjord. And um, yeah, the mountain mountainous region is bound by the uh, Girard de Guerre Glacier, um, the Giant Glacier, and the East Fjord, which is actually just a, yeah, a side arm of the Kaiser Franz uh, Josef Fjord, which is rather famous in East Greenland. So she managed to actually got credits for the area. And we can see it there. If we can um, zoom in, it's north of the um, of the bottom, very bottom part in that uh, chart. And yeah, there we actually see it where the CP is. This area is the Louis Boyd land. I'll zoom the arm. A bit. Um, so it should be better to see. Now, now you have to direct me. Yes, it's actually um, at, the, at the bottom now. When, now it's actually in, in the center of the picture. Oh, okay. uh, if you could zoom in there um, a little bit more, that would be better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult. Zooming is not as it is. easy. Is yes, easy? Yeah, exactly there, where you have the CP. Uh, ah, ah, oh. ah. So this, this edge, uh, the, this mountainous region there, Let's that's the Louis Boyd land. Can get a bit ah here we go yes awesome great so you see there there is an isthmus between um, the two fjords and the one coming from the north uh, going south that actually is the east fjord which is the side arm of the kaiser franz josef fjord and this land uh, yeah just uh, awarded to her um she spent quite some significant time there and photographed the entire area um yeah pretty Great achieve, uh, achievement. Um, after the last expedition in that area in 1938, she also was awarded the Column Medal from the American Geographical Society. And she became the very first wom uh, woman to autograph their Flies and Explorers Globe. Um, I'm not sure if you know that, but the American <laughs> Never Society, heard of it, but, um, Geographical Society, they have a globe. And sounds important. This, ex this Explorers Globe is just signed by... Um, by members of the um, Explorers Society, but also on invitation of the Amer American Geographical Society. So, sounds a bit like one of these soccer balls that's been signed by all e the members of a team. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, during the time of our expeditions, the area of interest, particularly around Greenland, was um, regarded rather special interest. So it was not really something everybody would fail for. But... Um, that changed when the outbreak of World War II happened. During the time of our expeditions, the area of interest, particularly around Greenland, where she took all her research and her expeditions, was regarded rather special interest. That was nothing um, a lot of people would have looked in that's really um, special here, especially for Americans. But that changed then with the outbreak of World War II. And suddenly, the knowledge she had gained during her six expeditions to Greenland became of strategic significance. Um, a book she was writing about her 1937-1938 expeditions that really got halted from publication by the US government because they had strategic reason to keep that, uh, that information for um, the government. And indeed, she got asked to lead a geophysical expedition to West Greenland, Baffin Island, and Labrador on behalf of the government in the same year. So, at her own expense, she actually charted and outfitted the uh, schooner Afia Morrissey. And the principal purpose of that 1941 um, expedition, under the umbrella of US Bureau of Standards, was to obtain data on radio wave transmission in the Arctic regions. So completely different from what she's done before. But during the remainder of the war, Boyd worked on secret assignments for the U.S. Department of the Army, and she was awarded in 1949, after the end of the war, a Department of Army Certificate of Appreciation. The book that had been held from publication in the terms of uh, the World War was then eventually published after the war in 1948 under the title The Coast of Northeast Greenland. And if you're lucky, you might find a copy somewhere um, on Amazon. Importantly, her photographic record provides critical information to climate change researchers today. And that helps a lot to understand how the ice has changed over the course of the last century. 
She was very, very thorough in taking pictures. Um, she has a very, very narrow area she covered. So that gives a very detailed look um, on those changes over the past hundred years. Louise Boyd accumulated throughout the years many academic honors, uh, receiving an honorary law degree from the University of California, um, from Mills College, and in 1960, she was the first woman to be elected to the board of the American Geographical Society. She was also made an honorary member of the California Academy of Science. And she returned to the Arctic one last time in 1955 when she chartered uh, an airplane and became the first woman to fly over the North Pole. But uh, near the end of uh, her life, um, Louise experienced financial difficulties and had already spent um, much of her fortune outfitting and chartering her many explorations. So eventually she had to sell the family home in San Rafael and all her furniture. And she died in uh, September 1972 two days before her 85th birthday, uh, requesting that her ashes be scattered in the Arctic Ocean. So it has a very sad and tragic end, but with quite some impact, um, starting with kind of this um, golden kite living as a child, but then having the abilities to actually uh, pursue your own, um, your own expedition, your own explorations. A pretty awesome story, I think. Uh, yeah, and... Uh um that it's pretty cool because it is a story about a woman who, who are as as we said at the beginning often overlooked and overshadowed by their male counterparts and uh history has a lot of them so um it is important to bring them to the surface thanks for doing that um yeah that is it for this episode we are going to be back in a week from now and uh with another installation of our Polar Explorer series that um, I find this very exciting. So uh, we'll, of course, we are, of course, online. You can find us at Curiously Polar on the social media or at curiouslypolar.com. You can get this podcast wherever you find your other podcasts. And uh, with that, thanks for being tuned in. Till next week, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.